The message you're about to listen to is a message from Apostle Eric Nyamiche, the chairman of the Church of Pentecost. Apostle Eric Nyamiche preaches the gospel in its simplest form to help the believers walk in Christ and also how the believer relate with his world. This year, the message is on unleashing the church to possess nation. Join us and let's learn from Apostle Eric Nyamiche and be a blessing to the world. If you are new to this page, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you can have access to it. Make sure you go to our own page and check out for more videos. Thank you. My car was a man, I'm a baby, no more. Praise God. Me, I'm a man, 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 I'm a Will you be diligent in prayer and in reading and studying of the Holy Scriptures? And you responded, yes, I will. Shall. Will you faithfully discharge the duties of your office, preaching the word of God and administering the sacraments? Will you preach only Christ and him crucified and risen? Will you be a shepherd to your flock, faithfully ministering to them, especially to the poor, the sick, and the weak? Will you be faithful to your calling in season and out of season, ministering not only to Christians, but also to others? Then he responded, I will do so. The Lord be my helper. Will you consecrate your whole time and strength to the service of the Lord in the church, the church of Pentecost? Your whole time. Whole time. Sometimes, if it, because of the Monday rest, when you call a pastor, somehow on Monday he becomes angry. Meanwhile, you said the whole time. Here, yeah, we didn't put Monday inside there. You see, we are just making a concession for you just to rest. But don't get angry when you are called on Monday as if we are broken a taboo. Shall we go back to that, please? Strength to the service of the Lord will be at his disposal whenever he calls you. Willing to suffer hardship and if need be, even death for his sake. Even death for his sake. I will do so, the Lord being my helper. Let's move on. Will you be, be subject in the Lord to the duly constituted authority of this church, of the Church of Pentecost? Duly constituted authority. People who have been effectively elected, will you? Be subject to them. But you see pastors, you see some people, they just go out and all they do is to castigate leaders. Meanwhile, you responded that I will do so. Even when we have made mistakes, because of loyalty, you cover our shamefulness. Famisima. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
you know that we represent the church and that when you are destroying us, you are destroying the church. But anyone who will destroy the church of God, the Bible says the Lord will destroy him. I want us to complete it. Will you, in keeping with the high calling, be diligent to frame and fashion your life and the lifestyle of your household according to the teaching of Christ and make yourself and them as much as lies in your power. Oh, some examples for the flock of Christ. And he said, I will do so, the Lord being my helper. Now then, the officiating minister will conclude, having understood all this, then he will give you your charge. It is this trust and charge that all of us here ought to be loyal to. We need to be faithful to the trust and the task. I'll open up what I mean by loyalty by sharing two examples. And if my time is up, I will just stop uh, because I'll about me to meet you somewhere and then I'll continue. I'll talk about two brothers. Joab, Asahel, and Abisha were from the same womb. Great fighters. David chose Joab, Asahel, and Abisha to be his commanders strategically. At least if somebody will kill him, not Joab, Asahel, and Abisha. Asahel died early in life, so not much is known or said about Asahel in scripture. But I'll talk about the other two in respect to loyalty. Let me start from Joab. See, Joab killed two Israel's army commanders. He killed Abner. He killed Amasa. In both occasions, the king didn't know anything about it. But he is the king's command. He is, he is the king's commander. What that means is that he is the one that should take the king's command and disseminate it to the truth. So he should not do things that the king is not unaware. Because whatever he says to the truth or whatever he does, he must take it from the command of the king. But he killed two commanders of Israel that the king was not aware. But Despite all that he did, there's one occasion that what he did, in my opinion, was just too bad. And one who is a loyal person ought not to do that. Second Samuel 18, I want it to be projected so that we will be able to interact with it. I'll read just the verse 5, and I will continue from 8. The king commanded Joab, Abisha, and Itaiah, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to, to each of the commanders. So three commanders, Joab, Abisha, and Itaiah. Then the king said, be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. Somehow, the king has to go to battle against his son, this rebellious young man. But how can the king look at the son in the face and kill the son? And so he says that, let you go for battle. Go, go and face my son, but be gentle with him. And all the troops heard it. Now let's jump to verse 8. The battle spread out over the whole countryside. And the forest swallowed up more than more men that day than the sword. 
Now, Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule. And as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. The very hair that he was shaving every two years. His pride. For him, the Bible says that he was handsomely beautiful. From the crown of his hair to the soles of his feet, the Bible said there was no blemish. Great, beautiful young man. And he says that the hair got caught in the tick of the tree. Now, he was left hanging in midair while the moon he was riding kept on going. Do you see the picture? Now, let's move to the next verse. When one of the men saw what had happened, he told Joab, I just saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. Next verse. Joab said to the man who had told him this, What? You saw him? Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? Then I would have had to give you ten shekels of silver and a warrior's bed. Who is qualified to give warrior's bed? I thought it is, it is the king. Yeah. Why is he playing the king? Who gave him that authority? And he said, what? You should have struck him dead. Let's listen to this man. But the man replied, even if a thousand shekels were weighed out into my hands, I would not lay a hand on the king's son. In our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Itaya, protect the young man Absalom for my sake. We all heard him say. The next verse. We all heard him say. And if I had put my life in jeopardy, and nothing is hidden from the king. This thing is true. Nothing is hidden from the king. You would have kept your distance from me. And said that, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know anything. As well. I don't know anything, no. Ghanaians will add, oh, they just, oh, God, you all can open up. Or train them where I didn't, yeah. People are like that since Adam. We all want to run away from trouble. And if I had put my life, in, let's take verse 14. Job said, I'm not going to wait like this for you. So he took three javelins in his hands and plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. He killed him while he was still alive. And ten of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck, struck him, and killed him. This is the king's son. Look at how they dealt with him. I thought King David brought Joab to help his kingship. But look at this man. In the hearing of the whole troops, the king said, keep my son, please be gentle with him. And somehow, the hair has been cut by the trees. That is fine. The best thing to do is to release him. Release him and take him back to the king. Let the king deal with him. But he said, I will not wait for that. Are we not all aware sometimes when we come here and we set policies? Policies are ligaments that holds the church together. So from, like IMD we say, from Angola to, to Zimbabwe, you go around the world like that. It's we, all of us, what holds us together as ligaments, holding the body together is the policies. Now when you are an area head or a pastor, and you decide not to obey the policy, what you are effectively doing is that you are dismembering the church of Pentecost. You are scattering us. We all said this is what we are going to do. And we brought a circular letter. Why are you not obeying it? Are you loyal to the COP? Why? The COP is a body, not individuals. See, this man disturbed David so much. So when he was about to die, he made a list of people his son should deal with. 
The first on the list, Joab. This one. First on the list. He, he, he caused the king's heart to bleed. But I will take Abisha from the same womb, different heart. One day, David said, I long for, for water from Bethlehem. And Joab said, I will lead the people to bring you water. But to be able to go to Bethlehem, you need to cross the Philistines' army because they had, they had come somewhere there. You need to break through to go and fetch the water and bring the water from Bethlehem. Abishal led the, the, the young men, and then they were able to break through. They brought the water. When they brought the water, the king took the water. Instead of drinking it, he says, how can I drink this? And then he poured it down on the ground. Abisha should have said, what? If you knew, you would not drink. Sometimes it may be a Yankee Kevin Chen. And you look at your leader, some, your area head, no matter Kevin Chen. Abisha could have done that. Because why? If you knew you would not drink, why did you cause us to risk our lives? But he kept quiet. Another time he said, who will go with me to Saul's camp? That was a danger. Abisha says, I will go. Somehow they found Saul sleeping. And Abisha said, oh, we thank God. This is what the Almighty said. This is the day that the Lord has made. The king was fast asleep. But instead of killing him, he decided to mention it to the king before. Then the king said, you saw him sleep? Let him die his own death. I, we shouldn't lift up a finger against the Lord's anointed. If I were Abisha, I would have said, but you are also anointed. But David knows that that man, his anointing is public. It's not the time that you will come to your father's house and anoint you. This one is anointed for the whole Israel. He has been adored and he needs to respect him. But Abisha will keep his sword behind him and will walk faithfully behind David. If he doesn't want to kill him, I also would not kill him. There was a day that Shemia was throwing stones and insulting the king when the king was running away from Absalom, his son. He was even calling him useless man. Useless. And then Abishai said, who is this dog? Who is insulting the king of Israel? King, let me go and take off his head. Then David said, don't. Leave him, perhaps. It is God who is saying that he insult David. Maybe God will look upon my misery and the insult of this man and have mercy upon me. Then look at the theology. But Abisha didn't argue against the king. Never argued against the king. But let me take the big one. Second Samuel 21. 15. If you can read together, but I've seen that you are busy writing, so don't worry, I'll read. Once again, there was a battle between the Philistines and Israel. David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines, and he became exhausted by bread. Now, by this time, he was old. And Ish, Ishbi Benod, one of the descendants of Rapha, whose bronze spearhead weighed 300 shekels and who was armed with a new sword, said he will kill the king because he saw the king tired. And then he spoke to himself, I will kill the king. If he did that, he was going to become a hero. Let's move on. Shall we all say, but? But. The next word, Abishai, son of Zeruiah, this is David's sister, came to David's rescue. He struck the Philistine down and killed him. How close was he to David? And what was he doing on the battlefront? Where was his eyes? How could he manage to see that the king was in danger? I will suggest that he was quite close. I will also suggests that his eyes was always on the king. 
close and his eyes was on him to protect him. Very loyal to the king. Now let's take the next verse, please. Then David's men swore to him, that is the king, David, saying, Never again will you go out with us to battle, so that what? The Lamb of Israel will not be extinguished. They didn't just see him as somebody. They saw him as the Lamb of the whole Israel. And that if they killed him, the lamb of Israel would be extinguished. Once they anointed him, he saw him differently. And he said, please, you are the lamb of Israel. You are our lamb. You are our glory. So that it will not be extinguished. Brothers and sisters in the Lord. As supporting leaders of the Church of Pentecost, your loyalty is to God and to the church that has made you a minister. Loyalty in this respect means commitment to the body. Commitment to the body. It means faithfulness. Loyalty means sacrifice to the church of Pentecost. Loyalty means love, love, loving the church. Loyalty means going the extra mile. When we introduce the ministerial welfare practices, and then we gave some direction as to what to do and what not to do, so far as our finances were concerned, and how to manage the pastors. Somebody told me this. He said they were in a room, and this pastor overheard this overseer talking about the difficulty in his district. And so the overseer was saying that he needs to repair the motorbike that belongs to the district with his own money. So as he was saying it, this pastor woke up and said, what you are going to repair? Motorbike with your own money. Me, I will never do this. This ministerial welfare. I will never do this. That is why we have Joab and we have Abisha from the same womb. Who are you? Loyalty means going the extra mile. Loyalty means intercessory prayer. You see, people do not like intercessory prayer. And sometimes on Tuesdays, I think that if you're a pastor of the Church of Pentecost, if you're a sophomore and we're saying that this prayer is a global prayer for the advancement of the Church of Pentecost, I don't think you should exempt yourself. But if it were any other prayer where we said the sick should come, then you see all of them come up. When we began this intercessory prayer, the first day, almost 1,000 people joined. But when they saw that the thing was about interceding for the Church of Pentecost, we came to 300 on, on the Zoom. Because they are not interested. But intercessory prayer is the highest form of service that you can give to the Church of Pentecost. The highest form of service. Loyalty here means effective leadership. You providing effective leadership at wherever you are. Loyalty means defense. Defense. You defend the Church of Pentecost. You don't stand against her. No. We need to be careful so that because of the attitude of some members of the church, we do not destroy the body that has made us who we are and so become disloyal to the body or the church. People will always disturb you, but look at the big picture and stay loyal to the body of the church. Set the church aside as sacrosanct, not to trespass upon it. I will end here. 
that loyalty is not just supporting. What you have in your hands, you should be able to make it better. I'll talk about that some other time. Loyalty is to make it better. So it is not enough to just be loyal to the Church of Pentecost. What we have committed to you as a church, that body, polish it. Polish it. Make it better. So we can hand it over gloriously to the next generation. May the Lord our God fill our spirit and our soul and our minds with this love for the body we call the Church of Pentecost. And uh, by extension, the body of Christ. May this love of God that has already been poured in our hearts be extended from you to the church of Pentecost. Amen.